Have you ever heard of Abner Doubleday? It's likely you've been taught Doubleday is the inventor of America's greatest pastime, baseball. It's also possible that you know Doubleday as a prominent American general and an honored war hero. Only the latter of these two tales would be true. Despite having baseball stadiums named after him, even in Cooperstown, we'll find that Doubleday had nearly zero contribution to the sport we love. So who was Abner Doubleday? Where did this myth evolve from? And who really did invent the great sport of baseball? I'm Jake Storielli, and welcome back to Laughs from the Past. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Season 6 of Laughs from the Past. Thank you for sticking out the brief hiatus with us. My name is Jimmy. I've got Jake alongside, and we are geared up and ready for Season 6, the great sport of baseball. The legends, the stories, the lore, everything. Obviously, Jake and I are baseball enthusiasts. We just started a podcast called Talking Baseball. Baseball season just ended, and this is a very clear way to convert listeners from one show to the other. But you'll enjoy it nonetheless because we have a team of researchers and producers helping with this season that have a 10-episode arc that is fantastic. I'm really excited about it. So right off the top, shout out to Jared Gott. Jake, we know Jared Gott. He's in the... He's in the chats all the time. Joe Webster, Sam Deutsch, and Lucas O'Brien, who have been helping put this season together. We are really excited. I didn't know that we were going to open up with shots fired at Abner Doubleday right away. Do you feel bad, Jake? A little bit. My uh, my first time reading the intro, <laughs> I, I told you and Luke, I was like, damn, <laughs> uh, it's going down on Abner. So that's that's tough. It's pretty pretty brutal. I mean, everyone just kind of knows him as the inventor of baseball. It seems like he wasn't, and I'm pretty interested in in why we think this and and why he wasn't. Those are our mean, first tales. Seems like a good place to start. One of what I thought was my coolest things that ever happened in my baseball life was I played an inning um, on Double Day Field in Cooperstown, where they do some fun stuff up there. Struck out, struck out. Got to be honest with the people. How many pitches? Do you remember the at bat well? Does it torture you? It doesn't. I think it was, I think I remember the pitcher's nickname. I think the pitcher's nickname was Doc, so that's kind of pathetic that I remember that, but uh, that's what makes it a beautiful sport. Um, Newtown guy. Um, we could we could dig him up. We'll, okay. Maybe we'll put researcher Luke on that to dig through Newtown baseball. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's Ab- Abner Doubleday. It's James Naismith. I mean, these are in in the sports world, those names are lures. They're creators of sports. <laughs> That's incredible. Was Abner a popular name at the time? Had to be more popular. <laughs> I don't know how Is, popular. How many people do you think named their kid Abner because they love baseball so much? They thought Abner was the name of the guy who invented baseball. They tune into season six of Laughs from the Past, find out their son is named after a liar and a dummy. Whoa. I don't know yeah, about the liar and dummy yet. I haven't read the I haven't read yeah, the we episode. Don't, Abner might be a stand up guy. Don't know all the info. He might have <laughs> might have been wrongfully pegged as the creator of baseball, which I I don't know. I would I could use that. Oh, if I was pegged uh, as the creator of a sport, I would not deny it. I'd be like, hell yeah. Yeah. Isn't that insane? Like I'm I'm trying to think of like I don't know, we give movie directors and like song Song directors, music people, we give them a lot of love. Like you hear a song that like connects to you and you're like, dude, like that. I love that guy. Like, how did they come up with that? The inventor of a sport, man. If I met the inventor of baseball, I'd be like, dude, <laughs> like, thank you. I might bow. Like, baseball is the closest thing. I. <laughs> you were about to do like a Japanese bow there. Yeah. Bow's the closest thing I have to a religion. <laughs> Put that on a quote. Jake, uh, just before we get into the story that our researchers spent a lot of time looking up, 
Uh, Abner was very popular in the 19th century as a name for for males. It's a biblical okay. name. Saul's army appears twice in the New Testament. Uh, New Testament, but it was pretty much demolished by the long running hillbilly comic strip Lil Abner. So I'm guessing Lil Abner from the comic strip was a little fuck, little fucker. Lil Abner was Lil Abner one of the first Lils? Uh, no, no. I'm gonna be pretty strong that he wasn't. Lil Wayne. Lil Bow Wow, Lil Abner? No. Oh, Lil Abner was uh he's not little. I'm looking at the comic strips. He's a big beef beefy guy. Classic. I think. Anyway. Let's get into this. You ready? Where do you think you're gonna land? I feel like we're gonna like Abner and just be like he didn't like baseball. Or he didn't invent baseball. I have no idea. Okay. If anyone is this is your first time listening to Laughs from the Past, this is season six. There's a in incredible backlog of episodes i was a history major in college i enjoy history a lot i have a a good general knowledge or more than your average person jake likes stories and he's usually hearing these things for the first time i know nothing put it on his tombstone yeah. abner doubleday was born in Boston spa new york on june 26th 1819 his father was a veteran of the War of 1812 and later served as a U.S. congressman. Wow, that's cool. Doubleday attended school to study civil engineering and then worked as a surveyor for railroads before receiving an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1838. He graduated in 1842, finishing in the middle of his class. Damn. Hell yeah. That's... that's that's a tough end to like your, I mean, you can say that. About... Can you start saying that about me? If I ever get a Wikipedia page, I need it to be graduated from Central Connecticut State University in the middle of his class. Yeah. Or you know what? That's a... yeah, throw a near the middle of his class just to cover all our bases. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I don't know if I've ever heard that. <laughs> no. Is no one but you you always hear someone people, finish pe- top top or high in their class or they finish low in their class. You never hear, yeah, he finished middle of his class. Yeah, because you don't brag about being average, but on I promote bragging about being average here. Just yeah, gotta get my by mom, my mom was a huge promoter of being average. Yeah. Don't stand out. Yeah. After receiving a commission as a brevet, um, that's a word I'm pronouncing wrong. Ooh. Brevet, second lieutenant. I like brevet. Okay, second. Or it's brevet. No idea. No idea. Never seen it. Uh, as a second lieutenant in the third U.S. artillery. Artillery. Jesus Christ, Jimmy. Doubleday served in a succession of garrison duties before participating in the Mexican-American War. During the conflict, he served as an artillery officer and commanded a supply depot in Camargo, Mexico. Doubleday returned to garrison duty after the war and in 1852 married Mary Hewitt, the daughter of a Baltimore lawyer. In 1856, he was transferred to Florida for the Third Seminole War. Wow, so he's a military guy. Those guys, they have a lot of time to kill on bases and wars they're playing games so i'm guessing that's kind of um, my my hunches started as a wartime game is commanded a supply depot just code word for like he was the manager of a warehouse nothing on his military resume resu- resume seems impressive seems like okay. he basically just was like made sure that the garrison had guns in it I mean, we're thinking he he comes off as like a, he's a he's a bright dude, studied civil engineering, um, and it looks like he was given jobs in the military that was like we need a bright dude, we don't need like yeah. a fighter. <laughs> yeah, can you just man the garrison, make sure that like inventory is taken care of, count and- the ammo. <laughs> In 1859, Doubleday was stationed at Fort Moultrie in Charleston. A staunch abolitionist and supporter of Abraham Lincoln, he soon found himself surrounded by secessionist fervor. 
In the face of mounting hostilities in December of 1860, Doubleday and Fort Moultrie's commander, Major Robert Anderson, moved their garrison to Fort Sumter and abandoned the city's other forts to the South Carolina militia. After nearly a four-month standoff, militia forces fired on Fort Sumter on April 12, 1861. Doubleday, as second in command, is said to have overseen the first shots fired in defense of the fort. After a 36-hour bombardment, Doubleday surrendered Fort Sumter along with Anderson. So, I mean, they're caught up in a bad time because they're in the middle of, like, the South, but they support yeah. Lincoln, and all those militias are coming for all the forts because the Civil War is starting. Yeah, I never really, uh, I never really thought about that with the Civil War. You're a, you're a northern dude in the South, and all that stuff's happening. Got to go. Got to run away. Yeah. All right. So he he started the first like round of fires, like fire. So that's cool. It's cooler than what we Could thought you? before. Yeah, better. His street cred went up. Doubleday's first combat experience came in August 1862 at the Second Battle of Bull Run, Manassas. We did a whole epi- season on the Civil War. I wonder if Jake remembers anything. The Second Battle of Bull Run, Manassas, during early fighting near Bronner's Farm. Doubleday dispatched nearly 1,000 of his men to support forces under General John Gibbon. His reinforcements helped temporarily hold the Union line against a barrage by General Thomas Stonewall Jackson's Confederates. His unit returned to action the next day, but was pushed back by forces commanded by James Longstreet. Remember that big battle from the Civil War episodes? That was when Thomas Jackson, um, the the South was surrendering, and Stonewall Jackson um, said, uh, then we will finish them with our bayonets, and took out his sword. They didn't really do that, did they just sat on a hillside and waited and then did pretty good. So Doubleday yeah. was involved. But yeah, and Doubleday, again, think about where we've come in two paragraphs. He uh he was involved in some of the first first bullets sent and now I mean he's kind of got Stonewall Jackson on the resume, which I mean that's uh that's an all timer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were they were adversaries in one battle. That's cool. Yeah, that's nuts. Reassigned to the I Corps under General Joseph Hooker. I think that's, we call them prostitutes because of him. Hookers. Yeah. Doubleday next participated in the Battle of South Mountain in September 1862. After General John P. Hatch was wounded in the fighting, Doubleday took command of his division and successfully withstood a Confederate assault. He remained in division command for the Battle of Antietam, in which his unit sustained heavy casualties at an area known as the Cornfield. That's tough to have a battle place known as the Cornfield. Like, we were over at Bull Run. You know, we're at Antietam. Like, where were you? We were in the Cornfield. Yeah, I I see what you're saying. I don't know. I could see the Cornfield also having a spooky vibe to it. Like, oh, dude, you're in the Cornfield, bro? Um. I don't know. Also has like uh You think it was actually uh, a cornfield? It had to be, right? Yeah. I don't think you can name something not the cornfield the cornfield. Um unless you're trying to trick the enemy. Yeah, I don't know. Also has like a so a like, call of field for in my head, and maybe this is just polluted by nowadays in video games, but I'm picturing that just being like a level, like, all right, boys, we're playing the cornfield today. Yeah, I think that might be diluted by video games. I don't know. It just seems very yeah, it much feels like, like there's a hint of that in there. It seemed like war was in the video game mode. There is yet. dabbled in there. <laughs> all right. So anyway, after all that shit, he was uh, he was promoted to major general of the volunteers. He would play a significant role in the Battle of Gettysburg. Heard of it? During the first day of fighting, he was forced to take command under the I Corps following the death of General John Reynolds. Choosing to follow through on the battle plan already enacted by Reynolds, Doubleday ordered his men to hold positions near the Chambersburg Pike. His stubborn defenses finally collapsed in the late afternoon, and his I Corps then retreated through the town of Gettysburg to the height of Cemetery Hill. I feel like I Corps isn't how you say that. just sounds wrong off my lips, but I hope it's right. 
I corpse, yeah. What do you? Well, I mean, what's the alternative? One corpse or something? I think I corpse is okay. I think Apple just ruins things that start with I. Ooh, there's a hot take. iPad, i computer, i banana. This is all ruined now. Despite having to fend off superior force of Confederates for several hours. Doubleday was relieved of command by the I Corps by General George Maid. He participated in the second and third days of the battle as a division commander and was wounded in the neck by a shell fragment in the aftermath of Pickett's charge. So it sounds like what we're getting at is he's a badass in the end. Yeah, they this uh, our, our research has slow played Doubleday. Um, they went nerdy and now it's like, and maybe that's part of the picture there. That's what they're de- depicting. Is nerdy double day growing some hair on his peaches? Whoa, this next paragraph says that Maid refused to make him uh, commander or Meade. So he fucking hightailed it to Washington, D.C. to talk to Congress and was like, that fucking Meade's a motherfucker. I should be in charge. Uh, his handling of the Gettysburg campaign is awful. Plus, you got a bunch of pro-slavery guys in your ranks. Do you even know about that? So I don't know if I like this move or not, but he totally was ratting out the union. Yeah, very much a petty rat move. I'm, uh, I, I've got kind of a weird brain going on right now because I'm trying to like link each of his life experiences to baseball to to baseball and like this is like reporting the pitcher for pine tar (laughs) it's pretty good it's pretty good um oh i was gonna say something but i forgot jake sorry oh i was gonna say imagine being pro-slavery but fighting for the union like what a fuck it fucked up head you have yeah and, and like, what's your I end goal <laughs> yeah what is your end ga- i mean are those people technically like spies are those people just lazy <laughs> like i don't know i'm kind of for slavery but i've already got this set up i don't know all right i've been i got a lot of friends in the union army so i've worked know. pretty hard to climb the ranks here if i go over there i'm gonna be pretty low on the totem pole it's weird but according yeah. to our dude they existed they probably existed Doubleday stayed in the Army after the Civil War and in 1866 assumed command of troops in New York City. He was then transferred to San Francisco to serve as a recruitment officer. During this time, he was involved in securing the first patent for the city's cable car system. Damn, that's cool. Doubleday late. If he invented the San Francisco cable car system, that seems like just as cool as inventing baseball in a way. Like those are just as famous in a way. Yeah, I th- just as famous for us, it would be definitely a tier or two down. Um, I don't know. Like, does, did Doubleday just live this crazy good life and that, like, some loser invented baseball? And they were like, hey, Doubleday did a lot of cool stuff and he's around it. Like, let's, let's give throw him it his way. Let's give it to Doubleday. Yeah. Doubleday later commanded an all black unit in Texas before retiring from the Army in 1873. He died in New Jersey in 1898 at the age of 73. Not bad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So he's a war he was cool war guy. Cool, smart, smart guy with a pretty good pretty pretty good couple notches on his belt. Stonewall Jackson, um, high up in the military, couple battles. Okay. Okay. Not bad, yeah. So part two. How did this American war figure get credited with the creation of baseball? That's kind of piqued everyone's interest at this point, right? Is what kind of what we need to know. This story has been spread far and wide over the last century or so, and there is both a stadium and a minor league team named for Doubleday. Former Major League Baseball commissioner Bud Selig even called Doubleday the father of baseball as recently of, as the year 2000. Bud was just looking for a distraction at that time, anything not to talk about steroids. Like, do you, you guys remember Abner? He was cool. He was cool. So how they call him Abby, or is that rude? Abby, I feel like I've heard that before. Because I don't know. I mean, Abby's a very prominent 
lady name, especially back then, I think even more. Well, no, because back then Abner's existed, so maybe Abby was unisex, and when they made Lil' Abby, Lil' Abner the cartoon, and Abner died, now now we only know Abby as uh, a woman's name. Because not for nothing, Abby, good baseball name. That is a good baseball name. Hey, Abby! Oh, do it again. Abby! Yeah, that's great. Abner, not so hot. I gotta. I don't think this guy was good at baseball. Do we think Abner played baseball or just Ooh, invented it? Because the vibe so. I'm getting right now is he was like, ah, it'd be cool if you did this and this and this. And like he walked past a bunch of kids playing. He never played, though. He was the first analytics guy. <laughs> he was crunching the numbers. You know how they always say, like, it's so crazy that they lined up the bases 90 feet away, and still to this day, it's the perfect distance. Yeah. That was Abner's job, I'm guessing. He just did the mental math. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Like, they were playing this sport, and Abner just tweaked it. You've got these Abner's- bases too close. <laughs> yeah. I, a, no, 100 feet? Let's put the bases at 90 feet. Came over with cocktail napkins and drawings. It was like, I think if 90 feet, you're up the odds of safe plays and... Close proximity plays. A well-placed bunt, you can still be safe. And they're like, whoa, chill out, Abner. Yeah. Abby. He went by Abby. Abby. So how did this myth begin? To decide who invented invented America's game, A.G. Mills commissioned a study in 1905 and asked the public for stories about the game's origins. The idea was sparked by former professional players and business tycoon Albert Albert Spaulding, who disputed an article written by Henry Chadwick that said the baseball evolved from English games like rounders and crickets. How could you dispute that? What's to dispute? Abner Graves, a mining engineer from Denver, submitted a letter to the Mills Commission claiming that Doubleday was indeed the man who invented baseball. When Mills issued his report in 1907, he wrote that a circumstantial statement by a reputable gentleman in reference to Graves helped determine Doubleday as the game's founder. So one letter from another dude named Abner just sealed the deal? That's one of the biggest red flags that you could show us. The fact that another Abner went to bat for Abner. I'm now thinking that Abner Doubleday is Abner Graves. Oh, okay. And he just like this. couldn't fathom giving himself a different name. And he just claimed it himself. Abner crew rolls deep. All right, hold on. The next line is, however, the tale, the tale isn't true. There are ah. many problems with Graves account of Doubleday but the dead giveaway appears in Doubleday's 1893 obituary, which explains that he was rather averse to outdoor sports. Yeah, I mean, we know Abner's not a player. We figured that out. Well, no, again, he was ahead of it on. He was in domes. He liked playing inside. No, there was, yeah. he was not an athlete. I think he was thinking of two, the 2000s when we were going to have retractable domes on stadium. The Army took Abner Doubleday in, and they immediately gave him jobs that required his mind and not his physical skill. They're like, you know, count the guns. Yeah. That's how you know he wasn't an athlete. Averse to outdoor sports. That's a tough line. I mean, I think they're saying he's fat. Back in, like, the 1900s. Ooh, I've got him being geeky. Abner like Doubleday. skinny and scrawny. I'm looking at pictures of him now. Weird hair. <laughs> Dude, he's got like Princess Leia hair. <laughs> he's got like Whoa. He's got like the buns on the side of his head. <laughs> like you see that picture of him with his hands folded and the mustache and the Princess Leia hair? Yeah. What's that about? He's a weird looking dude. Yeah. You see uh, the picture. Of, I mean, that's photoshopped of him just holding up a baseball and a bat. Yeah. He looks beefy. That's. I think he's probably an uncoordinated fellow. Okay. He looks like his body's the shape of a penguin. I'm more impressed by his look than I thought I'd be. Well, the hair is utterly ridiculous. The hair's almost a not talking point for me. 
I don't understand. I don't. Oh wait, hold on. Do you see this one where he's looking right? He's looking. Maybe over the other thing is maybe Abner Doubleday invented the baseball hat to cover whatever's going on on top of his head. Uh, he his hair is wild. Okay. Ah, or, sport. Yeah, sport. We th- we'll we'll put on hats. <laughs> what? I had nothing to do with the gameplay, but I did suggest the hats. So you're welcome, lids. If that's not enough for you, there's further evidence that Doubleday had absolutely nothing to do with the origin of baseball. He wasn't in Cooperstown in 1839, and he never mentioned the sport in his 67 diaries. Okay. What does that mean? Kind of not into Doubleday anymore. What makes one diary different than the other diary that you're like, I have 67 of them? Don't you just have one diary that you... It took it like took sixty seven books. Is that what they mean? Maybe he just got in too deep. There is a link there. I don't know if we want to go into that, but maybe he just got in deep where like he had a diary, and then he knew like people could find it, or he knew someone found it, so he did that as like a faux diary, and then he had like here's the real diary number two, and someone found that, and it was just a vicious cycle. Yeah, I don't know. Sixty seven diaries. I think it's one diary. You just. You wrote so much you needed another book. Yeah. Okay. It's not clear why Abner Graves was so certain that Abner Doubleday invented baseball. I mean, because he was anyone that just wrote a letter. Graves would have only been about five years old in 1839, so it's unlikely that he personally witnessed and remembered the details in his story. Yo. This Abner Graves dude saw a post and was like, tell us your stories about baseball. And he was drunk as fuck. And he was, he was just made up a random line. He was like, I think Abner Doubleday did it. And now it's, yeah, he, it's changed he, the he, world. He was getting bullied for having the name Abner. Someone said, you know, there's been no famous Abners in this world. Oh, oh. wow. Oh, you, yeah. you didn't know that Abner Doubleday invented baseball? Oh, just your favorite sport was invented by an Abner? <laughs> Abner Graves, he's the he's he's behind all this. Yeah. Oh, the two men were classmates at one point in Cooperstown, but Doubleday was stationed at West Point during the window of time that Graves claimed Doubleday invented the sport. Okay. But rather than give the British credit for starting baseball, Mills wanted the game to be uniquely American. I get that. And Doubleday's right. status as a Civil War hero made him a convenient selection. I, I have no fault in like when Graves writes that letter and then that logic. Like, cool. That guy fought in the Civil War. We need this to be an American sport. Bam. But yeah, uh, Doubleday, I don't get Doubleday what Graves' the deal was. Why didn't Graves credit himself? Why do you credit you, another random actor? You know admiral? why. It's a namesake thing, right? We're pretty hard on that. Abner's for life. Abner stick together. If Abner Doubleday wasn't credited, Abner Graves saw where the name Abner was going <laughs> by the wayside, and he threw one last Hail Mary. If if you didn't hear that Abner Doubleday had invented baseball, would you have even known the name Abner? Did Abner Graves save the name yeah. Abner? Abner Graves saved Abner's. I bet Abner has a comeback at some point. That'll be like a hipster name at some point. (sighs) Mill's report on the origins of baseball came 15 years after Doubleday's death and featured little to no substantiated evidence for the claim. Wait, so Abner Doubleday doesn't even fucking know that he's credited with inventing the most popular sport in America? (laughs) Like, yeah. He's got fields named after him, and he died not even knowing what, not even ever in playing sports or enjoying sports, just with his Princess Leia hair. It's classic. wasn't Wasn't like Van Gogh like broken, like not popular until he died? Isn't one of those artists really famous for that? But that person, Van Gogh or whoever we're talking about, they could die like saying, "I hope my music lives on." You know, right. like Abner just said, he didn't do any of that. 
Well, and he also wasn't involved, so <laughs> that's that's where we're at. Jim, I, I I actually and I read the next line, which I think we need to get to because it's it's important. Uh, no one bothered to fact check Graves' story, an oversight that would likely drive today's journalism's and record keepers mad. And even stranger twist to the story is that Graves eventually ended up in an insane asylum and died in 1926, leaving the mystery unsolved. I mean, the guy was insane. He answered an open call. Does anyone know anything about baseball? And he was like, my old classmate Abner Doubleday invented that shit. And then- my, my, oh, my name? It's, uh, uh call me A. Graves. <laughs> This is not an Abner thing. An insane man made up a fib and it stuck. That's, hey, that so far is the more impactful story. You say anything confidently enough, people will believe it. I bet there's people out there that are like Abner Doubleday truthers. Like, honor the man. Like, why sully his name? And I think if Ab- Abner Doubleday came back from the dead, he was like, I was a war hero. I don't yeah. like baseball. Yeah, that's I, and I think that's what we're running into. Like Abner Doubleday did so much good stuff that it's like, ah, screw it. I don't know. Yeah, he invented it. Why not? Oh wow! Did you see this picture of Abner Doubleday with his wife? Mm-mm. They have like the same hair. It's on his Wikipedia page. She's over his shoulder, and she has like the real buns can't really get over his hair i don't get it yeah so anyway part three jake who really did invent baseball it's such a weird sport when you think about it compared to all the other sports that have targets on the end and you have to put an object into another target on the sides you know on both ends hockey basketball football soccer all clockless. the same format. What? Clockless. No clock. No clock. Yeah. Um, so this is what we got. It is unlikely that any one person invented the sport. Rather, the game probably evolved from a series of European stickball games, and the rules changed over time to create baseball as we know it today. However, Albert Cartwright is credited as the father of baseball, because he drafted a set of rules in 1845 that became the basis for the modern game. Oh, cool. You want, we got the rules here. Yeah, we looks like there's 20, so let's, let's try to hit them high and quick. <laughs> All right. One, members must strictly observe the time agreed upon for exercise and be punctual in their attendance. Huge. <laughs> Huge. Got to be there. <laughs> well, this game doesn't exist if everyone doesn't show up. <laughs> Can't play if you're not there. <laughs> when assembled for exercise, the president of his, the president of in his absence, the vice president shall appoint an umpire who shall keep the game in a book provided for that purpose and note all violations of the bylaws and rules during the time of exercise. That would have been Abner Doubleday's job. He right. was such an umpire. The presiding officer shall designate two members as captains who shall retire and make the match to be played. Observing at the same time that the players opposite to each other should be as nearly equal as possible. The choice of sides to be then tossed for and the first in hand to be decided in like manner. So they're gym class. Two captains, choose your teams, try to make them equal. The bases shall be from home to second, 42 paces, from first to third, 42 piece paces, equidistant. A diamond. No stump match shall be played on a regular day of exercise. What's that mean? No idea. No stump match? Got nothing. I don't know what a stump match is. I mean, I guess we'll move on. A stump match. I don't know, but I believe in the rule, you know? <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm finding that like stumps are cricket wickets and maybe they meant like, Hey, if we play this, no playing cricket, I have no idea. Yeah. I don't know if there should not be a sufficient number of members of the club rep present at the time agreed upon to commence exercise. Gentlemen, not members may be chosen in to make up the match, which shall not be broken up to taken members that may afterwards appear, 
But in all cases, why did they just fucking say their rules? Yeah. Members shall have the preference which present. I don't. I'm over that one. If members yeah. appear after the game is commenced, they may be chosen in if mutually agreed upon. So if someone shows up like, hey, can this guy play? No. If you miss, if you miss the number one rule, this is so baseball. If you miss the number one rule, it's okay. We wrote in a rule at seven that you could still play. <laughs> Even though we said the first rule was get here. <laughs> no, but no, this is fine. You're here late. Okay. You know what happened? When they were having the rulemaking committee, one dude wandered in late. And they were like, oh. But we like Joe. Joe yeah. wouldn't be able to play. Like, let's all agree See, that if we agree upon it, Joe's cool. I think there was definitely a tactic at one point where it was like, hey, you know, their best player is Joe Schmo. We're going to distract him for just before the start of the game because he oh, missed out. Can't yeah. play. Yeah. Kill his horse or something. You're thinking. Whoa. Uh, I was going to say di distract him with some skin. But okay. that's usually where my mind does jump. The ball must be pitched, not thrown for the bat. Smart. I don't know what that means. Feels like it shouldn't be written, but okay. <laughs> I think they mean like they use a pitch underhand or something. I don't know what that means. A ball knock knocked out of the field or outside the range of the first and third base is foul. That's a big one. Yeah, home runs are foul balls at first. That's like, a big don't one. fucking hit it over that fence. Yeah. Three balls being struck at and missed, and the last one caught is a handout. If not caught, it is considered fair, and the striker bound to run. Holy shit. Run on drop third strike is from the beginning of time? If not caught is considered fair, and the striker... Wow, yeah, that one, that one seems like it wouldn't be a first ruler, but yeah. I thought they invented that because pitchers got so good... And catchers weren't blocking it. And they were like, this sucks. We're just chasing balls nonstop. If you throw that pitch, we get to run. Yeah. That's crazy. It was the drop third strike. You can run on a drop third strike was the 11th rule made in baseball. Yeah, I'm trying to see if we're like misreading it. I don't know. That seems right. Yeah. If a ball be struck or tipped and caught either flying or on the first bound, it is a handout. So, yeah, if you caught it on one hop, it was an out back in the day. Uh, there's an old one school. One hop was out? One hop was out, which kind of is cool because think of all the dives you can do if you get that one hop. I watch. Yeah. There's all those videos of people that dress up like old timers and play these rules. And there's some cool highlights where they're, like, catching on the bounce. Yeah, I kind of like the one bounce. When you don't Never. have gloves, it's pretty cool. All sports are made for offense, man. Three handouts, all out. <laughs> that's a weird way of saying there's three outs in an inning three handouts yep. all out everything else is written so like whatever players must take their strike in regular turn yeah all disputes and differences relative to the game to be decided by the umpire from which there is no appeal that still exists well there's replay now but umps are law <laughs> so rule 17 stuck for about over a hundred years too long hundred years too long no ace or base can be made on a foul strike ace of base well, coming into play yeah they were just getting loopy at the end here that didn't have to be phrased that way no ace or base can be made on a foul strike so I think ace is a strikeout so I think ace, ace is an out base is getting on Yes, yeah, so like if you you can't foul out basically. Yeah, if you if you hit a foul ball and it's not caught, you can't advance. <laughs> you can't be out. That's kind of cool that that was an original rule. Yeah, a runner cannot be put out in making on base. A runner cannot be put out in making one base when a balk is made on the pitcher. What the fuck? Balk was the nineteenth rule. They were allowing you to catch a ball in one bounce, but there was an umpire calling box. Well, I think like base stealing used to be like so rampant. Like base stealing used to be like one of the biggest parts of baseball because there wasn't home runs in this version of baseball. No, it was a foul if you ball. Hit it, if you hit it out, yeah. So that was like a mistake. So base stealing was a key part to original baseball. 
Um, I want to go back real quick. Um, dude, at Jim, I know you're not going to like this, and I don't really either because we're baseball traditionalists, but what if a foul ball, if you had two strikes, meant you were out? Baseball would be a two-hour game. <laughs> it would suck. We might have sacrificed an, an hour of baseball every game <laughs> because of Rule 18. Yeah, it would really change. I mean, it sucks, though. That, I'm not yeah. a fan of it. Oh, that. it would be awful. They knew what they were doing. Yeah. But one base allowed when a ball bounds out of the field when struck. What? What does that mean? One base allowed when a ball bounds. Oh. I think that's like uh, like if a ball goes out of a play, like a base runner gets one base. Oh, you can advance? No, it says when I struck. So. All right, we have a... Uh... Oh, okay. All right. Producer Luke is on it. He thinks they mean ground rule double here. So bounds means bounce. We know that because you can make an out on one bound. So but one base allowed when a ball bounces out of the field when struck. So yes, I think if it bounces out of it's a ground rule double. So that was an original rule as well. Okay. Damn. The first recorded baseball game was played on June 19th, 1847 at the Elysian Fields in Hoboken, New Jersey, where Cartwright's New York Knickerbockers defeated the New York Nine by a score of 23 to 1. That's fucked up. What happened to rule? What happened to rule make the sides even? A couple things to impact at the end here. New York Knickerbockers playing the first baseball game. That feels like a good bar trivia question you could take with you anywhere. And the New York Nine is a badass team name. Yeah, but Jake, rule three. Yeah. Rule three, players it's opposite a bad draft. each other. Everyone has a bad draft. <laughs> players man. opposite each other should be as nearly equal as possible. Okay, we drafted the rules. Game one, 23 to one. Pitching matters. Damn. It's brutal. Uh, okay. Actually, and... Hey, how about a credit to baseball here? The first official game was played. The final was 23 to run, to 1 and they said, "Let's play again." They played again after that? A lot of people a lot of people would say, "Hey, that sucked." Yeah. Well, you know, the winning team played. They were like, "Let's go again." Right, but that's baseball. The losers came back. It was a really really big amateur sport in America for a long time and when and when people, like, each town had their team and you would just play, you know? And when they tried to make professional league, people really didn't think it would work at first because they're like, this isn't a professional sport. What are you talking about? Right. And there was no professional team sports back then. It was horsing, horse racing and boxing. And for yeah. a long time, until, like, the 50s, it was horse racing, boxing, baseball. Those were the three major sports of America. Still so, are. Pretty crazy. So, in conclusion... Abner Doubleday, despite being an honorable American war hero, was not the founder of baseball. The story began from a poorly fact-checked news submission that wanted baseball to be solely an American claim, and the actual game was created by a group of fine gentlemen in New York. Uh, I think it would derive from rounders and cricket and, and, and stuff like that. But yeah, fucking Doubleday. I get the vibe from everything we know about Doubleday, that he doesn't like in his grave, he doesn't like that he's credited with baseball. He's like, I was never a fan of that. Yeah, he's kind of pissed off he doesn't get more credit for the other stuff. Yeah. Um, Abner Graves but, is the true hero and villain of this story. I, I hate to, to be the traditionalist, and uh, I'm going to reference a, a, a golf rule everyone knows. Sorry to Cartwright, the father of baseball, but this is kind of a play it as it lies kind of thing. Like, it's already out there. We're not going back to Cooperstown and renaming Doubleday Field. The inventor of baseball, it's like known. Uh, like, I, I just think the book's been written and like, uh, it's I a have kind one, of no harm, no foul. I got one more smell test. I'm going to Google image Albert okay. Cartwright, see what he's working with. And I might, okay. I might become a Albert Cartwright truther. Like I might make it my okay. mission. That's fine. Every Friday morning at nine a.m., I'll say I'll just tweet out Albert Cartwright doesn't get enough credit. Invented baseball. Okay. Well, when you Google Albert 
Cartwright. It's like a minor league player. So that guy better be good. Albert Cartwright baseball. That's a good Google search. There's a baseball yeah, player is, named Albert Cartwright. Is he Cartwright. like active? Uh, former professional baseball player from the island of the Bahamas. Followed by MLB Pipeline. Damn. Do you think this guy even knows? You know, this minor league player whose name was Albert Cartwright from the Bahamas probably showed up at so many minor league stadiums to have some, like, 80-year-old baseball writer like, Albert, did you know your namesake? And he was like, oh, I don't care, mister. I don't care. He got cornered so many times. He was a prospect for Houston and then a prospect for the Phillies. Never made it above uh, double A. Tough sport. That was not the point of searching Albert Cartwright. No. So who's? how do I distinguish that I want the old man? Because Jimmy, uh, the inventor of baseball, is Abner Doubleday. I'm sorry. <sighs> the Abners won. Give them their one win. Are we sure it's Al- Albert? I need to find a picture of this guy. Is it Alexander? Is it Albert? I think it's Alexander. Because if it's Alexander Cartwright, then we have a huge win on our hands. It is. I yeah. mean, can you? He's got a moon face. He's got. He's got a full circle of hair. He's in the Hall of Fame. I mean, well, what more does this guy want? Jake, did you see his picture? Yeah. You see his chin pick. strap and then his hair up top. He's got yeah, a full that... circle of hair around his bare moon face. I'm not, I have nothing against Alexander Cartwright. Um, I can't believe this. I'm team, I'm team Cartwright. You're team Doubleday? I'm team Doubleday. I mean, I just clicked on a, a, a Sabre, the Society for American Baseball Research, that says the creation of the Alexander Cartwright myth. Like, I, I don't think Cartwright's a lock either. Damn, don't tell me. I'm sorry, man. There, I, I'm looking at an article right now. That's the creation of the Alexander Cartwright myth. So this is uh, the Abners won the war. Yo, uh, Alexander Cartwright, his nickname wasn't Alex. It was Alec. But they didn't spell it A-L-E-C. They spelled it A-L-I-C-K. A lick. A lick. So that's kind of a win. For Alec. I think that's because his hair had like a cow lick on the end. I think it's because, you know, Alec. Alex. Did you see the picture of him with a fireman helmet? Yeah, I did. That's a good pick. <laughs> that's like a really good pick to have in your arsenal. I'm all in on Cartwright. Well, this was uh, the first episode of season six. What's the official name of the season? It is Baseball's Greatest Legends and Tales. And the Abner Doubleday story is as weird as it comes. Just one guy wrote in. Jake, what's your favorite thing you learned on this episode? Ooh. Um, (laughs) That a crazy man, a literal insane man, has wrongly credited the inventor of my favorite thing. Mine is that the 11th rule ever written down was the drop third strike rule. Drop third strike, yeah. That's insane. insane. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for hanging out with us. I hope you're excited for season six. We got nine more baseball tales coming your way. Subscribe, rate, review, tell your friends. It's going to be a fun winter. Winter.